Buzz, Eddie M wants to know, do all team members need to cross the finish line or just one for their time to be scored? So Eddie M, this is a little bit different than last year. Uh, last year we required all members of the team to be on the finish before time stopped. But this year, only the member that's wearing the timing chip needs to get to the finish. And that keeps the uh, accuracy a little bit better because the chip is always going to be more accurate than a human stopwatch. Scotty P wants to know how do they determine the members of each heat? Hey Scotty, so the heats are seeded based on ranking coming into the event. So the best teams and athletes are going to be in the final heats. And the way they do it inside the lanes is the lanes closer to the center are the more competitive athletes and teams. Eddie A wants, has always wanted Eddie. to know, why are the top tier athletes in the middle lanes? Hey Eddie, so we keep the top tier athletes in the middle so that the spectators and media coverage is the easiest to see them. They're most likely to have the most spectacular performances, so we want to keep them in the in limelight. Andrew Stone wants to know, how can at CrossFit Games work on consistency of the judges across all regions? Seems some are more strict or lenient than others. Andrew, I've got a few answers to that question about consistency of judging. My first answer, my initial answer, is that it is very consistent. We literally have thousands of results that come across every weekend of regionals competition. The level of incidence is pretty low, so consistency is pretty good. What sticks out is when there is one discrepancy, and that seems to be what people focus on. They don't focus on the hundreds and hundreds of times that things are uniform. So, to answer your question more specifically, Every year we run rehearsals, every year we seed the judges based on experience, and so every year we're trying to build on that foundation to make things as consistent as possible. Corinne Check wants to know, what is the judging standard for feet during a ring muscle up? To answer your question about the feet height, the feet have to stay below the rings while you're doing your kip. So if the feet, any part of the foot comes above the ring, any part of the ring, it's going to be a no rep right there. Now, Stu and Sar want to know, hey, hashtag ask CFG, is there a minimum amount of reps required in the regionals to move on to the next event? Hey, Stu and Sar, yes, there are minimum work requirements. The first team event did not have one this year, but all the other ones do. And that's to make sure that the team is capable of working with all six members to keep going in the competition. We've got some questions about how we keep track of the time for our athletes, and here's your answer. So this red chip is what interacts with our finish line. It's on one of these little ankle straps. When this chip crosses our finish line, it trips our timing loop, which sends a signal back to our software that lets us know down to the hundredth of a second how fast our athletes finished. Typically, this is on the left ankle of our athletes. For the individuals, for the teams, it's just up to the team to make sure that the athlete with the chip gets across the finish as fast as possible. Tremendously busy. Did you just ask her? Like he told you he was busy? He's been playing Candy Crush with me right now. Um, I'm not competing in the West Regional this year. Um, I'm not competing at all anymore. I'm taking time to be with my family and have exited the competition world. That, those guys? <laughs> those are my kids. <laughs> Welcome to the CrossFit Games update show, the Monday wrap-up of week two of the CrossFit Games 2017 regionals. I'm Rory McKernan. This is Caleb Bainfield. We'll have uh, Sean Woodland and Tommy Marquez along just shortly. Hopefully you guys have been tuned in. You got to see that Ask CFG segment because we worked pretty hard to turn those around. And in the future week, we will make sure that we turn those around during the weekend as well. So keep those questions coming. We're going to pop some over even today to Sean and Tommy at the desk. The show today, first, we're going to cover California, then we'll answer your questions. So submit those questions now. We'll cover Central and Pacific as well in that order. So make sure you keep everything coming. Again, it's Monday. We're shaking off the hangover of the weekend. But more importantly, it's Memorial Day, which in the United States holds a lot of um, you know, nostalgia and a lot of importance. We recognize those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in battle. Now, we understand that CrossFit is a worldwide community. And there are equivalents of this and other, you know, I know you guys have Remembrance Day. Yeah. There's an Anzac Day, right? Yes, yeah. And I know that every country most likely has their, something similar, where they, we honor the brave men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice um, for their country. Now, 
it's a tradition worldwide, though, yeah. that most people do these hero workouts. In Australia, we do do Murph on okay. Memorial Day as well. So even though it's, it may be an American soldier who died, it's something that resonates with all of us. Okay. Uh, we don't have the tag board. Uh, we don't have the pictures for you that we want to show you. But if you, you guys go search. Yeah, you can see them here. If you got the groups abound. Let's show these to you, actually. We're going to search the hashtag uh, Murph. And we've seen, like, already today probably hundreds of people who have performed Murph at their home gyms. This is Black Hills CrossFit. That's their morning crew, huge group of people. Again, recognizing the ultimate sacrifice of people. I think it's amazing. Uh, CrossFit Cicero, they want to say thank you to everyone who serves and has served our country. We're so grateful. And I thought that uh, actually this next one was pretty interesting because, uh, oh, sorry, another group. This is a group of ladies who, um, she did her first Murph, 72 minutes and 36 seconds. That 72 is, minutes and 36 that's seconds. That's commitment. I like pain. it. It is, but I, it's, the, you know, it's what you do in a hero workout. Absolutely. Now, this one was my favorite. This is a mom who tried to make it to the gym, but she mistakenly woke up her toddler with her <laughs> alarm clock, and so she was forced to do it with him. And actually, if we can get to, once we get to the squats, you'll see that she didn't have a weight vest, but she did have a toddler that she held and did some, uh, some toddler squats here in a second. And you just got to use what you got, right? Pick no up whatever's around you. It doesn't have to be a weight vest. And hey, I guess at least you can involve your kids in your workout too. Well, it goes to show <laughs> for me. It's like you just got to get it done. And yeah. entertaining too. Like this, this kid's going behind the curtains. He's going around the place. And Here we there go. we There's go. There's your weighted squats. You, tell me, that, you tell me that's easier than a weight vest? That's I like a no. It's that's, wriggling. That's an RX plus yeah. front squat, in my opinion. And what I love about um, public holiday workouts, when we do them in Australia, we only have two workouts on the day. And so what that means is the entire community is there for either that one hour or those two hours, when normally during the week you have, what, seven classes, so it's spread out. Right. And that's what makes these workouts so much more special because you can share it with your entire box. And there's like 40, 50, 60 people there doing the same workout. Nope. No pressure, but I'm doing it uh, later on with Charlie Doobie, the producer. I and, knew this uh, would happen. And again, you know, no pressure, but you guys are welcome to join. I, would I love see to. lots of people from the USA, some people from Brazil. So thank you all again for joining us. Submit some questions. I don't see a lot, so I'm going to pitch one to the desk that came in yesterday. We talked about Becca Voigt. They referenced uh, Chase Ingram specifically, referenced her as someone he would put on his Mount Rushmore of CrossFit. And I submit to you guys from, sorry, I lost his name, but I'll find it for you. He asked, who would you put on your Mount Rushmore of CrossFit? So I think that leaves you four choices, right? Are, are we doing uh, just men, just women? We're doing a combined, some combined action? It's so action? hard, isn't Let's it? Let's go combined. <laughs> okay. So we'll two each, because I think you and I probably have the same one. Yeah. So you, I'll let you answer for both of us. All right, so if we're doing combined for me, there's two men, two women. The men, I'm going to go with Froning. Uh, obviously, that's a pretty mm -hmm. first ballot Hall of Fame choice yeah. there. Uh, Chris Spieler, is it would be my other uh, person on Mount Rushmore, just what he's done for the sport and what he's represented. Then I'd go, um, I'd go Beck Voigt, um, and then probably Annie Thor's daughter, yeah. I think, as the first two-time champion, just what, what she's done for the growth of the right. sport as well. And I, I mean, you could argue that uh, on the women's side, there might be some women with better numbers, but when you talk about firsts, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what the, the Mount Rushmore is all about. So you have Rich Froning, the first dominant male champion. You have Chris Spieler, who's, I think, the first sort of everyman icon, the, the, the first sort of fan favorite that we had that, that, that people could get behind, who, you know, everyone's, always, everyone's either been told they're too slow or too small or too old or too young or something, and, and Spieler embodied all that, and that's why I think people love him. Uh, Becca Voigt, the longest uh, game streak, and then, uh, of course, uh, Annie Thor started the first multi-time female champion. So, you, I mean, you could – there are a lot of other women you could throw up there too. Yeah, and, and for me, sometimes just as important as games finish and performance is the, the foundation that you provide that inspires others, yeah. right? And we see that with Spieler. We see that with Annie T. They were athletes that very much – and Annie T, mm -hmm. uh, especially being the first two-time champ – and really being the face of the women's sport as we started to blossom right. as a professional sport. And uh, she, I mean, you hear so many young athletes and up and comers saying, oh man, I saw Annie T on ESPN, or mm -hmm. I, see, I saw videos of her, and, and that's really why I got into the sport. And I think that's just as important. If we go four men, four women, one, one each, it goes a little bit different because my, my. We can combine leeway. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I got it. If, if, if I had just a men and woman Mount Rushmore for men, I'd have probably Froning Spieler. Mm -hmm. Um, Smith, Frazier, yeah. I think, and then uh, Voigt, Briggs, Annie, yeah. and Katrin, the two Icelandic women. Cool. So. Well, yeah, keep all the social media questions coming in. Ro and Kayla are going to be monitoring those. We're going to start recapping what happened over the weekend in the regionals, and, and we'll start in California. I mean, that was a that was a crazy three days out there uh, on 
every competition, really. I mean, it came down to a matter of seconds between mm -hmm. individuals, between teams. We thought we knew what the, uh, what the who the qualifiers were. Then we got a plot twist. <laughs> I mean, it was like an M. Night Shyamalan yeah, movie out there. <laughs> I, uh, it turns out Bruce Willis was actually a ghost. Right, I, yeah. I, I, it was an awesome Spoiler way alert. to finish the weekend. Uh, okay, let's start on the women's side, and we will start with the final announcement. It was down between Lauren Fisher and Maddie Myers, and this is the way it played out. And in fifth, taking that final qualifying spot with 463 points, Lauren Fisher! The announcements for the women were some of the, just the, you want to talk about a roller coaster of emotions? I mean, it, it was, we had everything. And, it, and that shot right there kind of embodied how it all went. Absolutely. It was both uh, two sides of the same coin right there. We saw, we saw Lauren Fisher obviously getting to go to the games. Maddie Myers realizing that her hopes of going as an individual were basically shot at that particular moment. And they're both training partners. They're both friends. We got to see a level of camaraderie, being able to share that moment with one another, despite being very different headspaces and having very different results. And that's the nature of competing mm -hmm. in this sport. Sometimes the people you train with, and you care for most in this sport, are the ones that are right next to you taking your dream away from you in a, in a very tough race. You mentioned that Maddie Meyer's hopes of competing as an individual are now done. However, she could go on Invictus's team. What do you think now is next for her? Well, I mean, she's, she's a very young woman. She's got a ton of potential and a bright future ahead of her. There's a ton of possibilities for her outside of just competing in CrossFit. She's an accomplished weightlifter. She's represented, represented the United States on the international level. She's done everything from compete at USA Nationals to Pan Ams and stuff like that on the weightlifting side of things. So she can compete there. Also, she's on Invictus's open roster, which means she's eligible to mm -hmm. hop on their team since they did send a team, and she's on the roster of the team that went because yeah. they did have three teams at regionals. And there's precedent. They've definitely had individuals hop onto the team at the games, so we could see her in Madison still. Lauren Fisher's going back to the CrossFit Games now for the third time as an individual. She's went as, on a team in 2015. What do you think her outlook is now for when she gets to Madison? I think it looks pretty good. This is a test that, that we've talked about that has a ton of games elements in it, and for her that's important because she, when she first showed up on the individual scene in 2014, she finished ninth at the games. She struggled since then. She's been battling injuries with her ankle, with her foot, and I think this is a situation where she was part of that 2014 class where everyone who's been in the top 10 has failed to come back and finish inside yeah. the top 10. I think she's got a few more years of experience under her belt. She got to hang in a very, very tough regional here that was, we saw it play out. And I think with the age, maturity, having school behind her, like she said in her interview, I think she has an opportunity to get back into that top 10. Another cool thing that we saw with the women's competition is that we actually have two masters from California going to the CrossFit Games as individuals. That's Kirsten Pedry, who is 34 right now, but she'll be 35 when the games roll around. That's why she's in that master's division. And Valerie Vobrel, who is 38 years old. As far as women who have been masters who have competed in the individual division, we haven't seen one since 2014 who's been above 35 years old because, remember, 2014 was the last year we had 17 regionals. We combined them. So now Valerie Vobrel is the oldest woman to go to the CrossFit Games under our current regional format. And I mean, she really, this was not expected. A lot of the, our attention was on Rebecca Voigt. She was training for the Games. Valerie Vobrel was not. How do you expect not only Vobrel, but also Pedri to do at the Games? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet, but I'm really excited to celebrate these two and the accomplishment that they had. Pedri, especially because she's had a kind of a roller coaster two years. Last year had to withdraw from regionals after being the number one seed in the Open from Northern California. And this year has just been a kind of a dream season for her. She qualified under the Masters 35 to 39 division. We've seen a ton of uh, stuff about her on social media about training her grandma, and now she gets to celebrate that by going as an individual. If you win a couple more spots down on that list, she'd be on there too, going as a, as a Masters athlete on the individual side. And then Valerie Vobrel, I mean, what more can we say about what uh, such a spectacular performance from an athlete that we may have thought we had seen the last of her on the individual side of things. She comes out swinging, has two event wins over the weekend. No finishes outside of the top 10 for her or for Pedri, has an average finish of six across the board across the entire weekend. And it's just so nice to see such uh, uh, a consummate competitor, someone who has 
uh, such a positive attitude and carries herself in a manner that is so balanced. And uh, I'm really happy to see her back at the games. We had drama with the announcements for the women, and we had a real big plot twist in the announcements for the men. After they had announced all five qualifiers, the last being Jeff Patzer, who edges out Wesley Rethwill, Julian Alcaraz, who finished fourth, decided to do something that we haven't seen in, in a long time. Due to Julian Alcaraz becoming a father and the due date being in August, he has declined his invitation to the 2017 Reebok CrossFit Games. So now, in that fifth qualifying spot, with 387 points, Wesley Rothwell! I don't know enough about Wesley Rethwell right now. I'm going to learn a lot about him here soon, but I don't know if he has kids or if he's going to have kids, but if he have a, has a son, he better name that son Julian Alcaraz Rethwell because what a gesture from Julian Alcaraz. Really, it was such a, mm -hmm. an awesome moment to have at the end of that announcement there. I mean, Julian Alcaraz just did uh, something we really haven't seen before. I, I can't remember ever any athlete giving up his game spot. But we talk so much about how athletes in the sport basically give up everything just to focus on training. And now we get to see the other side of things. He still got to go out there, compete, mm -hmm. show that he's one of the fittest in the world, and then showcase a level of balance that we haven't seen where he yeah. says, you know what, I'm putting my family first despite being able to compete and perform at such a high level. Don't need it. I'm going to focus on my family. Becca Voigt, meanwhile, is the big big story here doesn't get to go to the games but she as an individual she will be going as a master and we could talk about her for an hour and I don't think that we would do what she has done for the sport justice but when you think about Becca Voigt what are the first couple things that, that come to your mind selfless uh, I mean I, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to put into words what Becca has meant to this sport so far I mean she's just been She's almost like she's that one constant you always expect to see out in the competition floor, smiling, having a good time, you know, carrying herself in at the highest manner. You know, she's one of those athletes, win or lose, even though she maybe hasn't had the greatest finishes at the games, she's out there pouring herself into it and she gives back. You know, she's the person that's helping other athletes, newer athletes in the, in, in the village behind the scenes. One of those people that's providing that level of guidance and letting other people know that she's not just here for themselves, but she's helping set up the future of the sport by helping the up and coming athletes. Yeah, I think Pat said it the best when yesterday when he said a lot of people ask, oh, what's Rich doing? What's Matt Fraser doing? You should find out what Becca Boyd is doing because that kind of longevity in this sport, especially recently, is unheard of. And I don't know if we're ever going to see anybody uh, like her again. Let's go back to the social media desk. Hopefully you guys have some more uh, questions that have been coming in. I know a lot of people probably want to talk about Becca Voigt, but what else is going on now uh, on Facebook? It's actually blowing up, Sean. This is right. really cool. Thank you guys for participating so much. Um, there's some follow-ups on Mount Rushmore. There's a couple of no rep questions, some <laughs> Sam Briggs stuff. First, we're going to do um, a couple of athlete reactions, then we'll come back. But I just want to say on the heels of your, your Rebecca Voigt con conversation, Again, there's not as there's there's nothing you could say. I texted with Becca last night just to say, for what it's worth, you know, here are my sentiments and thank you so much. You're a legend. I understand that she's probably sad. Yeah. Just the, you have to go through the emotional roller coaster. But my hope is that Becca then can internalize that, put it to the side, and realize what an accomplishment, what an amazing legacy she has created for herself. And her post on Instagram was really cool. She said, "Hey, it's not over yet. Yeah. I got a lot more. I got a lot more to go." So. I just think it's amazing how she's redefining aging as well. Like outside of CrossFit, outside of the competition, how amazing she's been. For people that can look in and see how competitive she is and how fit she is at her age is absolutely amazing. To the competitors, we've had some um, reflection posts coming through this morning. The first one being Bear Republic CrossFit. So this is their team photo celebrating their qualification. Next photo was probably taken a, a little later. Diablo CrossFit having some uh, well-earned celebratory drinks. China Cho pictured celebrating her first place. And the moment that Sean and Tommy were talking about between Lauren Fisher and Maddie Myers when Lauren qualified in fifth. And there is the emotion right there. Another great, great photo between athletes Kirsten Pedry, China Cho. And 
the lady that we were talking about, Becca Voigt, says, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all the unconditional love and support. This is not the end. And that is exciting. The fact that this is not the end, I can't wait to see what she's got in store next. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm texting. I'm gathering information to answer your questions. We're just doing our job. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the post that I was talking about. This yeah. is not the end. She's got an amazing support crew. So as before the Open even started, I am so fired up for that 35 to 39-year-old Masters I category. Know. I don't know how much time we have for questions. There are so many. And so... Um, I'll address the first one. There's a bajillion people who want to know about pec injuries. What's our stance? Are we going to change programming? The answer is there's not enough information to tell. These are not far out movements that we've never done in CrossFit. Of course we're concerned. It sucks when people get hurt. Nobody, nobody likes to see that. Nobody wants to see a competitor withdraw because of an injury. But there's just not enough information. There's conflicting information. And again, uh, there's just more gathering needs to be done. So the answer is no, the programming is not going to be changed to the best of my knowledge. I'll get you guys another answer on that from people who actually have the authority to say so. Um, but Cool it. Just understand, like, yes, it sucks. No, nobody likes it. Um, we got some follow-ups on Mount Rushmore. Scott Healy thinks you should an, uh, add Danny Broflex to that. We have to <laughs> clarify for Mitch Collins. He was like, hey, look, Glassman's not on there, but I told you guys beforehand that this only includes athletes. Yep. Let's get to um, Jill Tolk. You mentioned uh, Julian Alcaraz, Sean. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time this has ever happened? I think it is. Sorry. Do you know? I, uh, I I, th I think that I, I was trying to rack my brain yesterday, trying to remember a time when I, uh, an athlete voluntarily gave up their spot to. The, was there some, something similar in 2011? Becky Clark. I, I, I threw you guys under the bus. Yeah, okay. oh yeah, yeah. Becky Clark. I think there was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was something That's similar true. in 2011, right? So I posted Sorry. a link. I posted a link in the comments. What? Half are these credit. guys are the, Half I credit. To give them credit. Yeah, that's a good call. That's a good call. Um, okay, cool. So let's let's move on to this one. Somebody, uh, Marie Brazil, asks, why why can you compete as an individual if you're actually a master? Be because the programming is standardized from those. There's no adjustments in programming for, through the open, or e uh, at least through the initial stage of the open, for you to be able to have to scale or adjust your workout. So since the masters leading up to I think, that's, uh, I think it's to the 50, 50 to 54 that we actually start to scale. Yeah, so yeah. every master up until you're 50 does the same exact programming that, that everyone else does in the individual side of things. So that still allows you to qualify as an individual in that regard. So if you are competitive enough, you do have that option. And Tommy, are you okay? I've seen you look so contemplative during the update show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you got a lot to talk about. Dude, that, yeah. that hamster wheel is yeah. always running up there, man. He's okay. <laughs> Thank you for the concern. Yeah. Thank okay. you for the concern. <laughs> All right. Um, everybody says they love Becca. Uh, shout out to CrossFit HQ from Afghanistan. Thanks, Carlos wow. Davis. Um, That's awesome. I assume you're serving or, or maybe you live there. There, um, there was, oh, do you have a you question? There was a question yesterday. Someone said that, <laughs> I can't remember the wording. It was something like, I want to be cool like you guys. What is your favorite meal to go to straight after a workout? Post-workout meal. Tommy's an eater. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, it depends. If, if, we're, if we're keeping it clean, then I'll make a couple of baked sweet potatoes, some, yeah. some steak, and then usually something sweet in there. I'll, I've been taking rice cakes and dipping them in Nutella. So, uh, <laughs> it's a strong that's, uh, move. Yeah, that, that's, been, that's been my go-to I mean, post If I get to just go destroy myself, I'm probably going to go, go get like a double-double protein style mm. and order a fries and something from the old In-N-Out. In-N-Out burger, yeah. yeah. Love that one. All right, we'll have, a, we'll have more from social media in a second, but let's, let's now dive in to the Central Regional. And on the men's side, if you, I said this yesterday, but if you had told me that a guy by the name of Paul Castillo and another guy by the name of Street Horner would finish ahead of Scott Panchik, I would have asked you, what are you smoking and may I have some? What happened here? Well, it's a good thing you're in Santa Cruz, Sean, because we can... Uh, <laughs> Easily accessible. We, we, can, we can set you up there, but... Uh, <laughs> Paul Castillo, what an impressive weekend from this guy. You know, I was kind of going through the leaderboard coming into the weekend, trying to pick a dark horse, and I was very impressed by some of the numbers that he's had for being so young, relatively speaking, comp competition-wise in the sport. And then just to see the poise and composure that he showed throughout the weekend, ended day one and first, comes back, doesn't have a great day two, a 12th and a 14th. Really, he's going to, on the outside looking, he was in sixth place going to the final day. Comes back strong, two top five finishes, a second to close out the day, and it's two of the first three days, or two of the three days in first. And he's legit. There's no mm -hmm. joke. You don't just beat these people yeah. by chance. And then the person below him on the leaderboard, Street Horner, I will straight up say, Street, we, we did not do you justice mm -hmm. this weekend. We did not talk to, about you enough because arguably, you were the most consistent of the bunch. That may yeah. not be reflected in placement, but only one finish outside of the top 10. Every other finish sixth or better, including a pair, a, a trio of top three finishes, three thirds to be exact. 
he was a guy that just kept hanging around, almost kind of like Bjorkman Carl Gumitson a couple of years ago. We kept hearing this guy's name, Street Horner in third, Street Horner in fourth, maybe not getting event wins, you know, maybe not blowing us away with one particular event, but showing consistency across the board. And that's the reason why he's in second place. And hopefully, I'm just excited to see what he can do at the games now. Yeah, and Castillo, you mentioned this, you know, he started day one in the lead, he won event one, and then he finished strong when he took second place in event six, and that got him to the CrossFit Games. I'm so pumped. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. It's been a goal for the past couple of years, and uh, I'm just happy I made it. It's awesome. Hard work. Just It feels good that it paid off. What's it like to be in a competition with your fellow competitors? It's crazy because you don't want anybody to do bad. You want to see everybody succeed. You know everybody put in the work just like you did, so it's tough seeing guys, you know, but when you're back there, you want to be all friendly with everybody. You want everybody to do good, but then you got to really turn it on when you get out here, and that's the hardest part. Well, you had a great weekend. We'll stand by for the standings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The men's side not going as we expected, but over on the women's side, now that is where we saw some order. The women who we thought would qualify would, but then in fifth place, Jessica Griffith, who is making her first trip to the CrossFit Games as an individual. Yeah, I mentioned that how, how composed and resilient Castillo was, but Jessica was very much in the same vein there. She, she ends day one in first, kind of surprised everyone. But then, this is what caught my eye. She kind of has a bonk, a 22nd place finish to start day number two. And usually that's that moment where we see, well, uh-oh, this is their fall from grace. But you know what? Every time she had a bad finish, she had a 22nd and a 15th, she came back strong. She had a fourth to close out day two, an eighth to close out day three to make sure she got to the games ahead of the likes of Kelly Jackson and Sheila Barden. And she's a full-time nurse, too. This is a woman that's balancing a, a very demanding career and competing at CrossFit. Hats off to her for being able to do both. At the top of the leaderboard, you have three veterans, led by Sarah Sigmund's daughter, then Christy Aramo, and, and Stacey Tovar, and Brooke Wells then finished in fourth. The, the highest expect, expectations are on Sigmund's daughter and Wells, given what they've done in the past. What do you see happening for them now as we move forward? Well, I think S Sigmund's daughter passed the test with flying colors and really just showcased that she's could be the best version of, of Sarah Sigmund's daughter that we've seen yet. Took a fourth place in event number one. Everyone's like, okay, that's pretty solid. From there on out, she takes two firsts, two thirds, and then closes out with an event record on the final day. And it wasn't just an event record by you know three, four seconds. She demolished yeah. Cara Webb's time by almost 25 seconds in an event that's sub four minutes. That was insane. She crosses the finish line, didn't even look tired, kind of had a <laughs> smile on her face, and that kind of put the world on notice that she is coming for the top of the podium. And then Brooke Wells. This was a situation where coming into the weekend, we looked at the programming and some of the elements that were involved with the short rope, the high volume muscle ups, uh, event one with a ton of the body weight movements with the weight vest. And we said this was going to be a battle for her. And it certainly turned out that way. But sometimes when you have a battle on your hands, you can see athletes fold or flourish. And she flourished at the end, especially when she needed a strong finish in event uh, number six. Her time, if Sarah Sigmund's daughter wasn't around, would have been an event yeah. record as well. She beat Carl Webb's time as well. So to finish strong like that from a young athlete, I think that now she can get to the game, she can breathe a sigh of relief and see what happens in Madison. I was really skeptical the way she started that she was even going to make it, but yeah, she proved me wrong. I'm very impressed uh, with that performance. Let's go back now to uh, Rowan and Kayla. Check in on social media. Hey, this is awesome. Most people are still actually talking about next week or they're still <laughs> on California. They didn't talk much about Central just yet, but to get caught up, I'm going to answer a question from Rusty Ross. How did Lauren Fisher get that no rep on the last no rep on the last kettlebell and didn't have to redo that? Um, I, I, as the way that I see it was, it was a judging error of the judge at the kettlebell. It was very explicit that if you drop from the top, you did have to return and finish another rep of kettlebell. So that was actually a judging error, correct? In her favor. So Lauren Fisher actually got that one in her favor. We got some stuff to look at. We do. We have some central photos for you guys, starting with Street Horner, and all he can say <laughs> is, holy shit. Yeah. And you know what? A, I, hey, my son's in the control oh, room. Sorry. Man. Holy <laughs> beep. And you know what? Uh, like, we missed it. <laughs> oh, it wasn't even there. Maybe his son flicked over to the next one. Uh, Zach Carcetti and his friend Nick, uh, he gave him gray hairs, and I can absolutely relate to that. Sometimes it's harder for the people that are supporting you uh, you know, to go through that whole process. A good old-fashioned selfie from CrossFit Mayhem Freedom. That's a picture of a selfie. Oh Yo, my gosh. Advanced maneuver. Wow. Yeah. There's Jessica Griffin, happy, sad, proud, humbled, shocked, earned, and so much more. 
Oh, we still get to see Street Horner, apparently. Oh, here's Sarah. Sarah. Yeah, I loved this post. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. She said, look, I made a bunch of sacrifices. I am all in this year. I may, I'm not doing anything but fitness, sleeping, eating the right way. And you're going to see something special at the CrossFit Games, and I believe it. She, she looks scary this weekend. She said everything she does 24-7 revolves around her as an athlete. Another great athlete, Brooke Wells. Me, after this weekend, I can finally breathe again, and so can we, Brooke. <laughs> um, another photo. Pure joy from Jessica Griffith. Good for her, man. Yeah, yeah she absolutely. Was fun to watch. And I just, you know, put this photo in for the for the fun of it. It's <laughs> Dave Castro with a dog sign, and the dog is actually saying wow. that he had a blast in Nashville. And thank you for all the people that took a photo that with him. That is one duck-sized dog head. Oh <laughs> my goodness! Oh, come full circle. Oh, 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 came full circle. <laughs> and here is the photo that uh, we we won't read the caption out for a second time. You get the picture though. Um, you can read it. Holy shit, um, <laughs> Gus! That's only to be used by grown-ups. No. Uh, Hey, I don't want to toot our own horn, but here at the social media desk, we, we featured Street Horner before the weekend even began. I know. He was the 13th fittest athlete, uh, 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 student athlete. I thought that was pretty cool. Maybe we should uh, do some reverse, uh, role reversals. All right, what do we got for you guys? Uh, we're going to make the trip. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. We're going to follow up with Carlos Manuel Davis. Uh, the, the, there's a whole platoon of soldiers watching us in Afghanistan. He's the guy that I said oh, was in cool. Afghanistan. Oh, so, that's awesome. Um, I'll just pass it over to you guys. guys. Shout out to uh, Carlos and his, and his platoon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks for all you do, and, and yeah, hopefully we're keeping you entertained today. Yeah, I appreciate you guys yeah, take, taking, that, taking time, especially out of a, a, a job that right. is so much more important than what we're just Amen doing here that. at the yeah. desk. Thanks so he much. Says, Stay yeah, safe. Your the time whole, is much appreciated. The whole platoon is going to try and make it to Madison is what he's saying. Oh, oh sweet. That's awesome. You have to stop. All right, we'll have to have, find a way to get him on an update show. Yeah, come by the desk if you guys great. make it to Madison, yeah. for sure. All right, um, you know what? A lot of questions about this, and, and I'll let you guys have it. Um, in particular, let me tell you who is asking. Um... Justin Bailey asked, like, with all this programming with dumbbells and no barbells, do you think that will continue on at the CrossFit Games, or are we going to see barbells at the Games? Uh. I think you, you probably will. And I've always said this, too. Like you, can't, you can't evaluate these competitions in a vacuum. You have to take the Open, the Regionals, and the Games as all one giant test. And I think that you know, we saw barbells in the Open. We went back to dumbbells, and I think there, it was pretty clear that there were definitely tests of strength and things were heavy, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that given the amount of events that we have to have at the games, we usually have 15 or 16, sometimes yeah. you know, maybe even more, it's hard not to have a barbell at some point in there. So will we see it? Yes. How much? I don't know, but I, I'd be uh, hard pressed to, to say that we're, we're not going to. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think just the level of tests that you mentioned, yeah. usually anywhere from 14 to 15, we're going to have that test involve a barbell at some point. That, that'd be my betting money. And in particular, I think uh, you just look at what regional serves a purpose for. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's to make sure that the right people get to the games, right? Yeah. So I think we might see some dumbbell stuff continue, right? Because that was part of the test that determined who was fit to go there. Um, but I don't think it, we'll just see this entire barbell games because right. that, that would be a huge right turn in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, Pacific Regional. That was the third regional that took place this weekend. And what was cool about here on the West Coast is we got to watch it at night. So that was a blast. But on the men's side of things, James Newbery wins, and that's not something we're used to seeing. We thought that he would be in contention for a qualifying spot, but a little bit of a changing of the guard maybe there at the Pacific Regional. Yeah, a little bit. I wouldn't say, say right away just because of the body work that Rob Forte has done, but James Newbery certainly made a case for himself being one of the, ne the next rising stars in terms of games performance in the Pacific Regional. If you look at what he did across the entirety of the weekend, every single finish, fourth place or better, he had a perfect day two with two event wins. By far the most consistent athlete across the board. He even said that this programming suits him well, but it's one thing to say that programming you know, suits you well and it's nothing to go out and execute that. And I think what we saw from him last year, making the games, getting to go to the Invitational on the Pacific team, sometimes an athlete just needs to get over the hump once yeah. and we see this snowball effect of improvement. I think that's what we're seeing with James. Uh, on the women's side, congratulations to all, the all five women who qualified out of there, but at the top, it was clear if you watched any of that competition, Carl Webb and Tia Toomey are in a league uh, all their own. Yeah, it was another great battle from them and, and something that I was excited to see, you know, this third iteration of, of Webb and Toomey going head to head at the, uh, at the Invitational. And Carl Webb, I was very impressed. I thought both of them showed signs of improvement. Carl Webb, this particular event had so much body weight uh, relative stuff. It had a lot of games level-esque things, something that Carl Webb maybe hasn't excelled at the level she's excelled at at regionals before. And I think she passed the test with flying colors, coming out and getting yet another regional event win with these elements that I just mentioned. She talked about 
at length all the changes that she made and it's clearly showing with how well she performed on the floor. And then Tia Toomey, for some, some of her, her fans and people at home, I said this yesterday on the show that she may think that of this as maybe not quite the result that she wants, but she improved across the board. Her, she improved in average points per finish, which I think is a huge thing and over the course of time at something like the games is going to pay off. I think the fact that she led for two days, mm -hmm. something she had never done at regionals before are both very big hallmarks that she can kind of circle and look at the weekend and think this is a success and we're going to see yet another outstanding performance from her at the games. The, region, the reason why the Pacific Regional is one of my favorite to watch is just the vibe down there, not only because of the crowd but also the athletes. And if you watch the entire thing and you stayed till when the women were going to be announced uh, at the top five, there was a really cool moment. The athletes were on the floor and then y, YMCA comes over the, the speakers and, and this is what ensued. And that lady dancing around, Olivia Boone will be going. I don't know if that uh, torn Achilles is stopping her from dancing at all. And the entire Wynn Entertainment Centre getting in a bit of YMCA action. Great to see her. You can't get behind it. It looks like so much fun. It does actually. I love to see Tia Claire having fun. You know, I she's know. using her reserve. The athletes in the Pacific region are so amazing. And to be honest, the thing that I really felt the most that I was missing out on was the after party. Oh, it man. is so amazing in the Pacific region. I got a live notification on Instagram that Con Porter was live. It looked like his friend had stolen his phone and broken into his room after they had had a long, long night. So and, many uh, things. Yeah, it faded to back very quickly. Um, to black very quickly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, some quick clarifications. I apologize. Corey Cam Cameron was the man who submitted the Mount Rushmore question. Aaron Williams was the young lady who submitted the uh, question about barbells at regionals. So thank you guys. Sorry for mixing everything up. And we went through some athlete reflections on the Pacific region yesterday. Here are some more that have come through. James Newbury said it was the most competitive showing in the six years that he's been at regionals. And that's an amazing thing. I think sure. the athletes are always getting better. It's always getting harder. You're always having to up what you're doing. And uh, James reflected that. Ricky Garrard, who's been trying for a couple of years, has finally made it. <laughs> really excited to see what he can do at the CrossFit Games. I think he can do a great job. Another person that's been trying for six years, Jess Coglin, And, um, you know, she does her thank you post through here. So also very happy for Jess. Uh, dear Claire Toomey looking very fierce. Um, I'm excited to see what she can do at the oh, games yeah. this year. And Alethea is such a lovely person. She says a special thank you to the judges, medical personnel, announcers, event directors, security and so much more thank you. And she calls them the true heroes of the weekend. <laughs> and this is the question that I answered earlier. But there it is for you on, on screen. So thank you to Holly, Holly for that always one. Always a participant. Thank you, Holly, for submitting Hi, questions. Holly. Patrick Brown already has a response to you and he said, Rory, you know that the Fit Aid after party puts the Pacific to shame, and what? I gotta be honest. Really? I've never done the Pacific one, but I've done the. I've been to the Fit Aid uh, Madrid after party. Oh. Actually, I was there even when I was in Copenhagen. Right. And uh, that place goes crazy. Is that next weekend? Correct. Oh well, yeah, maybe. We, got, uh... we have a lot to look forward to next weekend. Um, Kincaid says, "I love the Aussies." I love Carlos you too. Carlos Davis again says, "YMC action uh, was awesome." And um, we got a lot to look forward to, my friends. We thank you for being here today. I wish you a happy Memorial Day. I uh, hope you guys go hit any uh, hero workout, to be honest with you. Murph's a fan favorite, but there's, a, uh, there's so many of them to choose from. Just remember, it means a little bit more than your typical workout, so give a little bit extra effort. It is a special day. Next week, guys, we have the Meridian Regional, the Atlantic Regional, as well as the West Regional. Brent Fikowski will throw down trying to pen his regional title. Ben Smith goes up against Noah Olson and Bjork Vin Carl Goodmanson, the next superpower for the men in the Meridian Regional. On the women's side, Sam Briggs, fan favorite, will be throwing down in Spain. Emily Bridgers and Emily Abbott will be on different coasts, but they will both be attacking the same workouts. Sean and I are going off to Spain. Yeah, you're yourself. leaving us. Tommy are going to be here to hold down the fort, and I know you get a very capable hand, so we hope that you guys tune in. This could arguably be one of the best regional weekends. Keep using those hashtags, especially the Ask CFG. We promise we'll get your questions answered. It's so much fun 
when you guys interact with us. I had a lot of fun with you this weekend. Yes, thank you. So the gentlemen at the desk were amazing. Sean, Tommy, and Kayla, thank you all. And uh, on their behalf, I'll say thank you guys for watching us, and we will see you next weekend.